Farmer, um, very fine musician, very good pianist. Uh, he's the artistic director of Nimbus Records, who very kindly took me on, you know, onto their label. And um, he'd, you know, I knew he was quite enthusiastic about my music, but I never expe expected him to ring me up one day and say, could you write some songs for me and my soprano that I work with? Um, and he said, as the, the centenary of the outbreak of World War I is coming up, could they in some sense be connected to mark that anniversary? Um, so that's, that's how that came about. My dark side has always been fascinated by <laughs> really kind of, um, one shouldn't say miserable, but, um, you know, the dark side in poetry, the, the tragedy in life, the, um, and there are a whole lot of things. I mean, like the section from the Apocrypha that I took, I was always fascinated, even as a young man, I was fascinated by the kind of nihilism of it, really. Mm -hmm almost more nihilistic than Nietzsche so uh, um, and then I'd always loved a Hausman and so you know he was an obvious choice because in fact the the overture that I wrote for the New York based Albany Symphony Orchestra The Gale of Life that title is a quote from a Hausman poem you know, and that's where it, it came, you know. There, you know, once stood the Roman, you know, and now stands I, the gale of life through him blew high. Um, it's, so So I'd, I'd always had a kind of collection of, in my mind, bits of pay, favorite poetry. Um, and Gray's Elegy um, has always been a real favorite. Um, so, you know, the, that, so that's how bits of, of grey came in there. So I didn't want to choose things that were sort of portraying war. Mm. You know, there, there are some of the Owen poems about gas and watch out for the, you know, and the rattle of guns. I, I didn't want any of that. I wanted to make it slightly more general so that it was about human loss generally as well as the the... The, which is why I didn't just choose World War I poets. I chose a variety of poets. And then I ended with that slightly more optimistic poem. Um, just, yeah, I just thought a, a little bit of uplift at the end. But I don't know about you, I've always found that if you face these things and, and you, a lot of this, this poetry that's to deal with more difficult subjects, once you've read it, it's actually like a kind of catharsis mm. that you do feel better for it afterwards. After all, you know, hearing a tragic work, you know, by Beethoven or whoever or Mahler, at the end of it, there is a kind of exhilaration. It's somehow that it has healed you in a certain way. So I've never really been afraid of, of having music that's a bit dark or subjects that are a bit dark. Just hold that up to the camera. I don't know if you can kind of see. Oh. Hang on, look, there's a whole lot of stuff over here. Uh -huh. And But what's remarkable about it, it's dated, one of these sketches is dated the 3rd of August, uh, 2013, Aliki's Beach, on a Greek island. Oh. And there was I writing this bleak music, enjoying a holiday on a Greek island in brilliant sunshine. <laughs> and I think that that just goes to show that, you know, people say, oh yeah, well, everyone's always affected by where they are and all the rest of it. Uh, I've never found that. Mm -hmm. You know, I could be 
you know, in the bottom of a pit, and if I'm feeling happy, and I'll, I'll write something. Um, normally, I, I I carry something like this, and um, this is just again. I don't know. Look, I mean, it's just full of. I've got yeah. books and books of. I just take a little book mm -hmm. like which fits in your pocket mm -hmm. and just scribble things down as I I feel like it. So that I mean, some of it can. I I find it hard to imagine. There I was lying on a a kind of um, beach chair with the Mediterranean lapping at my feet. You know, with a lovely glass of wine, and then writing this <laughs> in the sunshine. So. Um, that, that just kind of slightly amuses me. They weren't all written there. Oh no, there's another another one. That one was. Um, and also at the same time, I was finishing my third symphony because I noticed there are sketches in here from that as well. So that was going on at the same time. It, re it represents humanity. It's a human voice. It's what's happened to human beings. Mm -hmm. So it couldn't just be a wordless flute solo. Mm -hmm. You know, the words have to be spoken. There's always that problem with words, of course, and composers do get criticised that if the words are too good, what is the point of trying to write music with them? Or you can't top the quality of the poetry with your music, that you've got to somehow, you know, that the poems on their own are, are so brilliant that it's almost an insult to them to try and add words to them. And in fact, you know, I've a couple of things I've read where it's suggested that a composer chooses words that are a bit kind of banal or not terribly successful as poems mm. so that they won't eclipse the music. But I mean, I quite honestly, at my age, I, I really don't care. I, I'll give it a go, you know, and. Uh, why not? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I think one, one has to try. And these were words that I wanted to set as well. So Adrian didn't in any way tell me what poems he wanted or how many he wanted or anything. So um, it was quite nice just to be left to choose the number of poems to set. And of course, originally it was for voice and piano, but uh, Kenneth Woods, um, who's been a great um, advocate of mine who's principal conductor of the um, English Symphony Orchestra and also music director of the Colorado Marla Festival but he it was him who suggested that I orchestrate them but but for for strings mm -hmm. so that's the version that I think works best actually although I having heard the piano version it, it does it does work but of course as you know some of the the slower songs and most of them are fairly slow the, the sustaining ability of the strings, of course, which you, you don't get with the piano, you know, the, the sound decays, obviously, as soon as it's sounded. Um, but but they, I have heard them played with piano and, and you know, pianists play them really well. Um, but I think I prefer the, the string orchestra version, yeah. I mean, I think that the texts suggest the mood so that's kind of and i think once you once you started um but the fact that each of the songs ends with this modal cadence i think that was something that um and i didn't notice i was doing it until about the fourth song and i thought gosh i've i've put this this cadence um each time um and that it just seemed natural to carry on doing that um, I think it's probably just a bit of luck that they link together so well. Um, although, you know, who's to say? I mean, I, I don't know what goes on in my subconscious. Mm -hmm. So, so I think some of you know some of the judgments are, are instinctive. They're not not a kind of thought about thing. I think because the the, the, of the historical context of some of the texts, it kind of seemed natural that it should have a kind of English folk flavour. Obviously, I, I didn't kind of think of that like I'm just saying to you now. The, I mean, I'm being like these awful analysts after the event. 
I didn't kind of think, oh, I know, blah, blah, blah. Right, now I'll sit and write the music. I, I responded to the words and I found it, it seemed to be natural that it should be gentler in tonality than my, a lot of my orchestral music. Obviously, because you've got a vocalist, uh, it, the lines should be more singable. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't sort of, you know, be ah, ooh, ah, ooh, you know, all over the place. But and it wouldn't suit the, the character of of the text either. Um, so I, I think it's got something to do with with me wanting it to have a kind of or noticing it had a, an English feel, almost a sort of Vaughan Williamsy bit, um, you know, to it. Who of course used used modes a lot. Mm -hmm or that ca a cadence with a flat seventh. It, it still, it creates that kind of sadness as well, because it's not as final as having a sharpened leading note. Mm -hmm. You're going bomb, bomb, you know, you've got ta -da, you've got just this little rise and fall or coming from the other way. And the bare fifth, of course, is that these are questions which human beings still haven't resolved. So why have a minor or a major third in there. I mean, you think of the terrible things that are going on as we speak, you know, in Israel with the Palestinians and the Jews, it's just chronic. So all this kind of stuff is still relevant today, sadly, but then getting back to being a human, you know, a singer, the, the singer, you know, represents humanity, is the human being um, expressing those thoughts. You know, I, I, I was quite quite surprised at, at how they turned out in the end. And they were actually quite easy to write. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if that's because of all those years I spent at the Opera House. You know, uh, and as you've mentioned, you know, those nice lyrical lines are written for the oboe sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, and the principal horn, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, that. So I think I, I respond to melody and I appreciate melody. Um, even if for some people, you know, like my late father-in-law, it might not seem normal. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, with slight twists and turns. But, um, I mean, I just hope people get something out of it. And I hope the performers enjoy performing it. Yeah. And, and I'm really kind of quite chuffed that futility, which people thought, how could I dare to set it? Because Britain had set it. I actually read a review in Gramophone magazine where one of the reviewers, I think it was Guy Rickards, very distinguished musician and reviewer, said that he preferred my setting of it to Britain. Oh, wow. So oh. I just, yeah, well, and if I'd, if I'd shied away from setting those words just because Britain had, you know, why? why? You know, give it a go. So if anybody else wants to set those words, go ahead and do it. Don't worry that someone else has done it, because who knows what you'll come up with.